So yeah, um, uh, I'm a member of the Trading Solutions SRE team at Bloomberg, and I'm going to be talking about why you should have interposers in your bag of tricks. A little bit of background. I've been at it for a really long time. I started at Bell Labs in 1980 uh, doing uh, Unix performance engineering. I've done a lot of things in uh, 40 years. Um, uh, so they all have a kind of performance engineering kind of, um, at least I've put a performance engineering kind of twist on things, uh, even in the distributed transaction management field. Um, in terms of Usenix, uh, my first Usenix was in like the 82, 83. It was uh, Boston Copley Plaza a long time ago. Right? Uh, I gave uh, Usenix talks in 88 on uh, a kernel tracing package uh, that I co-developed. And then in 1990 on uh, virtual memory performance improvements. And uh, just earlier this year, uh, I gave a talk at SRECon uh, on uh, the, the need to get visibility into logging and other low-level libraries. Um, uh, so th this will be like two talks in a year, which is kind of uh, you know, uh, odd uh, and stuff. Uh, kind of a glutton, I guess. Um, and uh, uh, how many people uh, uh, saw the uh, Unix 50 kind of events last week? Um, yeah, so basically, uh, you know, the, this year's like Unix's 50th birthday, I, I guess, right? And, and so the folks at uh, Nokia Bell Labs in Mary Hill, they hosted a two-day event, and there was uh, one of the things was a panel session. You can find it on YouTube, right? Um, uh, so Steve Johnson, you know, a, a, the panel had a lot of you know, Unix big names from way back and stuff. So Steve Johnson kind of, uh, uh, when he had his turn to talk, uh, he, he spoke about uh, you know, the importance of Usenix. And the, uh, and the organization that kind of facilitates exchanging information, making it a, a big part of, um, of uh, kind of the growth of Unix and open systems. I think that was a, you know, a good call out for uh, Usenix and, and things. Uh, so I'm glad to be able to talk. Um, so uh, the outline for my talk is pretty simple. Uh, basically, I'm uh, going to talk about the need to kind of modify behavior uh, uh, in software. Um, and sometimes uh, an interposer is just what's called for. Um, and I think it's underutilized, so that's why I'm kind of talking about it. Uh, I'll go into a brief overview of what interposers are and how, how they work and stuff. And then I'm just going to cite a few examples, going through some examples, and I'll close with a summary. So, and so um, as, as an SRE or an uh, sysadmin, you know, you're given some software, you know, whether it's uh, kind of uh, homegrown or a vendor or even open source uh, software. Right? And it doesn't quite do exactly the way, uh, doesn't behave exactly the way that you want it to behave. Um, so uh, you, you kind of have, at times, have to kind of adapt it to your local kind of um, conventions and things. And so, sometimes that, that, that's in the area of visibility. Uh, I think that now people use uh, the word of observability, right, to add metrics and logging. Sometimes it's in the area of uh, error handling and resiliency and things. Uh, but it kind of it doesn't do exactly what you want, right? And sometimes it's just flat out bugs, right? Um, but if we don't have the source code, or even if we do have the source code, but we don't want to kind of muck, muddle, muddy the source code with the changes that we need for like a particular run, like say in test, right? Um, uh, we need kind of mechanisms to kind of change behavior. So um, interposers on Unix. Um, uh, kind of leverage the late binding, right? The, the, so these days, right, if you do, um, if you're looking at executable, you do an L, uh, LDD on it, right, or if you do an NM on it, right, you'll see a lot of unresolved symbols, right? And if you do an LDD, it'll give you a list of the shared libraries that it depends on. Right? Um, and, and so the, 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 the runtime linker that handles the, the, the late binding is the one that kind of takes these unresolved symbols and then kind of figures out where to resolve it from, which, which shared library to uh, resolve it from. So I might intend for the unresolved symbol in my executable to be resolved in you know, shared object one, which might be the, like the C library, for instance. Right? So, but because it's late binding at runtime, you know, there's an opportunity to kind of say, OK, I want to kind of take that, uh, a symbol that's defined by the same name um, and, and have the unresolved symbol resolved to that one by kind of putting shared object two in front of shared object one and getting the runtime linker to, uh, to do that for you, right? This is that runtime, right? This is not a compile time. Um, uh, but, uh, and, and replacing the kind of function is somewhat easy, right? Um, because you just have to change the order, if you can, right, uh, of searching. 
But sometimes you also want to wrap, right? Uh, you want to invoke the original function. You just want to enhance it, and decorate it, and things. So that's pretty much what interposers do, is that it's a mechanism for kind of taking um, an executable with unresolved symbols and uh, getting uh, a, a new library there that implements some of that stuff right, that, that's unresolved. So um, for my first example, I just want to kind of go to A to I. Um, so uh, uh, everybody familiar with A to I? It's a C library function, right? So well, you know, A to I is really simple, right? But the kind of thing about A to I is that uh, it doesn't do much error checking, right? So you pass it a string, it'll give you a number. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a signed number, so you can't use negative numbers for error codes or anything like that. A2I doesn't define that. In fact, if you look at the man page, you know, it gives you the spec for A2I. And so things like the first um, example, you know, uh, the string dash 1, 2, 3, 4, you'll get minus 1,234. One, 1, that seems okay. Um, the second one is questionable, right? Uh, 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 if you pass it the string 1, 2, 3, space, could do, uh, you'll get 123. Um, if you haven't done the input validation to see whether that's what you intend or not, you'll get 123, right? And so, and so forth. I have a bunch of examples, right? A couple there. Um, so if you've got software, let's say some financial software that's provided to you, um, and it's using A to I, but it hasn't, and you know, I do this all the time too. I, I don't do the, the proper input validation, right? So, so it, it doesn't do the input validation. What happened there is that it'll take a string and Give, give a number and then pass maybe the results downstream, and then it'll cause problems downstream. Right? Um, so, uh, and, and this actually happened uh, in a place that I, I worked. Um, and so, uh, a solution here uh, would be to interpose on A to I, right? to kind of replace the A to I function that's in the C library with your own. Right? And uh, here, I, uh, so the pattern that I normally use for doing that is to do man and then the function get the spec for the function, follow the prototype, right, the, 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 the function prototype and whatever include files are needed, and then write my replacement. So here I'm writing a replacement to A to I, and what I do here is that I have a loop here that now is going through the characters in the input string and checking to see if they're all digits. Right? If there's anything that's not a digit, then uh, um, uh, so, so, so that's something that's questionable, right? Um, so I want to do something about it. The problem with A to I is that there's no way to kind of pass anything back um, uh, to do anything about it. So uh, in the spirit of failing fast, in this example, I'm doing an abort. Right? So uh, if, if, if this code is, if this program is part of some transactional kind of flow, an abort isn't the end of the world because you can roll back the transactions and then recover the input and, and then continue. Um, but sometimes it's, it, that's not appropriate, right? So what you can do there, again, because you can't return anything to affect the behavior of the program to which you don't have the source to, um, you can do logging, right? So you can log the, the, the fact that uh, here's this input, you know, and then some, someone can kind of go through, a program can kind of go through maybe and find the logs of those suspect strings and maybe do some compensating kind of work uh, downstream to make up for the, this kind of bad input. And so that's, a, that's a, an example of how I could kind of enhance A to I. But at some point, you know, you're going to get a string that's real, right? Uh, that, that's, that's a number. And you, you don't want to re-implement A to I, so you want to kind of call the real A to I. And that's a problem, right? Because if I say A to I now, I've now done recursion, right? I'm referring to myself. So, uh, so how do we call that? Uh, and that's, I'll, uh, I'll cover that in the next example. But in order to kind of use this now, I just compile it as a shared object, right, uh, using uh, whatever, you know, invocation uh, does that. And here, uh, you say minus shared in GCC. And then you do LD preload uh, on your shared object. Um, you set that environment variable for the, co for the command that you run. So, so that A to I only uh, change only applies to the command that you're running. And, uh, and the, the runtime linker, the LD.SO, kind of says, oh, okay, uh, you've, you've kind of set this LD preload environment variable. So let me load that first before anything else. And if I have any unresolved symbols, let me resolve it from this shared object first. So that's how I kind of get in the head of the, the queue, the, the, the line uh, for searching for symbols and have my uh, A to I replace the live C one. That's uh, pretty straightforward. Um, so the, the next example has to do with uh, debugging Malik. Right? So uh, in my uh, SRECon talk earlier this year, 
and I, I talked about this uh, use case where uh, we were having problems with the server. Uh, the server was getting tired as the week went on. So we had uh, weekly restarts of the server, and after the restarts, the server was nice and zippy. But as the week went on, the server got slower and slower and slower. It got tired. Um, and and uh, profiling kind of showed that uh, as time went on, uh, more and more time was being spent on malloc. So we needed to kind of investigate malloc, right? Um, and in order to do that, I wanted to kind of create an environment uh, that um, independent of the application. This, this is a server, so if I had to recreate it, I would have to run the you know, request through and recreate um, a, a real kind of set of input uh, every time I want to do an experiment. So instead of doing that, because the problem had to do with malloc allocations and freeze, I just wanted to kind of isolate that. So the, the way to do that was to kind of record all the allocations and freeze. Right? And then uh, then uh, put it into a format and then have a playback uh, program that reads that and just calls the allocation and freeze and replicating the problem. So it, cr it creates a nice, simple kind of test environment for kind of testing out malloc behavior and, and hypothesis. Right? So again, in order to do that, uh, you know, an, an, inter an interposer, right? In fact, um, in, I think in one of the malloc uh, pages, uh, it recommends doing interposers for kind of metrics for malloc. Uh, the, I think the malloc uh, implementers don't want to kind of add you know, uh, instrumentation code in, in, the, in their code. So interposers are recommended way for doing that. But for, for this use case, you know, I decided to write my own uh, um, uh, malloc interposer. I, I called it malox. Uh, it's uh, kind of uh, to deal with the pain and indigestion from malloc, right, and stuff. Um, so, um, uh, but uh, so the, 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 the difference here is that I have this kind of init function now, right, in this uh, shared library, and this init function is calling this function called dlsim. And what dlsim does is it, it kind of navigates through these shared objects and, and your address, uh, your, your namespace, and, and looks for symbols and returns the address of the symbols after they've been kind of resolved and lo loaded, right? So uh, DLSIM has a lot of different options, but the one that's, I think, most commonly used for interposers is this RTLD next. What it, sa what it says is that look for malloc uh, uh, in the search path going forward, right? So uh, find uh, the malloc symbol and return me the pointer to that. Uh, and so um, what I'm doing in init here is I'm doing a malloc, uh, getting the malloc pointer for malloc and then the free pointer for free, right? And uh, what, what RTLD next allows you to do is to chain interposers. Right? So if you had another interposer that also wrapped malloc, then uh, you can call the next one. So you would be invoking the wrapper, uh, and then it could then in, uh, get to the, the true malloc. Right? So, so DLSIM is kind of the way to get at the real function. Right? Cause you, then, then if you look at my malloc implementation, and here again, I, I've kind of simplified things. The malloc, if you do a man malloc, there's about six maybe functions that you need to implement to kind of capture all the allocations in the freeze. Um, but in the, in the malloc implementation, what I'm doing is I'm using the function pointer to invoke the real one. I'm, rec uh, I'm capturing the pointer that comes back from the size, and then I'm recording both the pointer and the size. Because if you're doing playback, there's no guarantee that when you do an allocation of a size that you'll get the same pointer that the original one. So you need to kind of build a map between the original pointer and just so that you know which things to free when you do the free. And so you do the same thing here, uh, but because now we're using the, the DL sim thing, um, you have to kind of use the DL library to get, kind of get that. So you create your shared object uh, that way, and then run LD preload, and boom, uh, I did LD preload on the server in production, got a kind of a binary um, trace of the allocations and freeze, uh, wrote uh, my playback program to kind of go through that, verified that the playback program also slows down yeah, but it slows down really fast because you're just kind of running through the allocations, right? And so you don't have to wait a week to, to see it. And, and then uh, you could do experiments. And, and so uh, th this allowed me to kind of do experiments and to dive into the malloc implementation, try different things. And uh, as a result, uh, the, the problem wound up being that uh, the, the server allocated a certain size that was problematic for the way that the malloc was uh, uh, maintaining buckets. So every time it did an allocation of that size object, uh, it created, um, an, added another item on the free list bucket that it would normally search for that size, and, uh, but it would be it created too small to be satisfied. So with every allocation, you would grow this free list to something that uh, couldn't, be, couldn't satisfy the request. So by the end of the week, you had 10 million 
uh, kind of free objects, none of which uh, would satisfy the request. They would go through the whole list looking for it and then give up and go to the next bucket and find something else. So uh, our workaround was just to add two bytes to the request and that kind of fixed that problem. But you know, having burned, been burned by this, uh, you kind of then worry about other patterns, right? Uh, other allocation patterns. So uh, what we did was to kind of extend this uh, kind of scaffolding and, and uh, basically put metrics in there, for timing the, 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 the malloc calls and the free calls and uh, putting them into a, a, a kind of response time histogram uh, f uh, for exporting to the outside world. So um, again, uh, uh, the, the, the interposer, um, I, uh, it's local, right? It only happens, I, I'm only uh, doing the malloc for the um, server process, not every process in the system. It's, it's local and uh, the way that I implemented the record and playback, well, just the record, um, it was very uh, fast. So I was able to kind of run that in production, get my uh, recording and, and, uh, and do my experiments. So um, for my third example, it has to do with JIRA. Uh, does anybody know, not know what JIRA is? Or everybody's kind of, so JIRA is a kind of ticketing workflow kind of product uh, uh, from Atlassian, right? Um, and um, uh, when I first uh, joined uh, uh, Bloomberg, I joined uh, a developer experience group that had the responsibility of maintaining the JIRA, the JIRA servers for the company. And one of the kind of tasks was to kind of take JIRA uh, and make it um, kind of a fit within the uh, Bloomberg Enterprise requirements. Right? And uh, one of the sticking points there was uh, attachments. So uh, again, if you're familiar with JIRA, you can create a ticket, and then in the ticket, you can kind of add attachments. Right? You can add as, as many attachments as you want. Um, uh, but the problem there is that the, the attachments are stored on the file system. And what that creates is a kind of you know, state on the server that uh, needs to be um, kind of either replicated or somehow kind of um, managed uh, on server failure. Uh, the Atlassian requirement was to kind of have the attachments uh, uh, sit on an NFS file system, right? So by doing that, you've eliminated the kind of local state, right? And you've kind of pushed it onto the NFS server. Um, the problem there with the mismatch was that uh, in Bloomberg, we not, not only have to deal with resiliency, but we have to talk about kind of a, a disaster recovery. And what that mandated was that the, um, and Jira kind of, um, at least the, the Jira that we had, uh, didn't run in any, cu in any cluster mode. Uh, and so uh, 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 we had to run a, a live Jira on one data center and then a backup cold J uh, Jira on a different data center. But our infrastructure team, for kind of good reasons, uh, didn't want to support, doesn't support NFS between data centers. And so basically we had a gap there, right? Uh, is that uh, we couldn't kind of satisfy resiliency given the, uh, the various conflicting kind of uh, situations. Uh, so, and, and there's another problem with the Jira tickets too, is that uh, you know, so the Jira tickets are kind of forever. You, know, you can't get rid of them. Um, and so the, the consequence of that is that the attachments are kind of forever. Uh, you, you can kind of remove attachments from the UI, but people rarely do that. And so what that means is that if you have a ticket from five years ago or 10 years ago, um, the, any attachment with that you have to kind of keep. And yet, again, the, the, the requirements is on the file system. So uh, we had a couple of times where we, ha we ha were running out of file system space. Uh, you know, attachments are pretty popular. People stuff, use it to store stuff, right? Um, so uh, so uh, we were running out of file system pretty frequently. and. Um, and we, we tried limiting attachment sizes, but you know, like, uh, measures and countermeasures, right? The users got used to that and figured out that they could break up their attachments to several pieces. There was no limit on how many attachments. So, and, and that's counterproductive, right? Uh, you know, uh, it doesn't help us and it doesn't help them. The, the, it creates work that they're working around our workaround, right? So, so what we really wanted out of uh, Jira attachment behavior was that the attachment should go to some kind of cloud store. We have an internal cloud store, so it would be nice to be able to kind of send the attachments to the cloud store. And uh, you know, the, the cloud store you know, has, it's an ex external service, external to the server. Um, uh, it's not, has the, it doesn't have the same uptime as, uh, as the servers, uh, as the kind of Jira server. So having the file system as a cache to a cloud store seemed like an ideal kind of situation for, you know, for performance and reliability reasons. Right? And if we had that, then the, the attachments on the file system, we could kind of remove at will. Right? You know, if you know, we could run a, 
regular script that says uh, any old attachments just remove, right? Because we know that it's backed on uh, in the cloud, uh, and it also kind of satisfies our um, our kind of uh, disaster scenario because again our internal cloud service is data center resilient, so there's copies uh, across the data center. So if we had to kind of move to the cold Jira node, uh, we wouldn't have to make sure that the attachment file system was populated. Uh, it would just be populated as a cache. So that's the kind of ideal behavior that we wanted. Um, and going into it, we were looking at different ways to do this, right? Um, in fact, there was a different team who implemented, so Jira's pretty malleable. Uh, it's, it's a big ecosystem with a lot of flexibility. Um, so you can add you know, things to the UI. And so a, a different team actually added a cloud attach button to the UI uh, for their use. Uh, and, um, and, uh, but the problem with that is that people got confused, you know, and sometimes you attach normally and sometimes you attach through the cloud. Uh, and that wasn't kind of an ideal situation. Um, Jira also has this uh, plugin architecture and there's a lot of different plugins uh, interfaces, but we couldn't find one that, um, that fit for attachments. Um, um, it doesn't mean that there wasn't one, we just couldn't find one. Um, and then, uh, uh, so Jira is not open source, but if you're a Jira licensee, uh, Atlassian gives you access to the source, so you can kind of look at it to see how it behaves and, and things. And, and uh, our kind of Atlassian support person even suggested kind of looking at the code and modifying the code and building our own Jira. Okay. Uh, the, the, pro the problem with that was that um, uh, looking at the code, we found maybe like uh, four to eight classes that had to do with attachment uploads. And another four classes that had to do with attachment downloads, right? and uh, and also Jira has this nice feature where um, uh, if you upload a, a an image file, it'll create a little thumbnail, and instead of the uh, the link, you'll get the thumbnail that you can click. So that's a nice feature, but that turns out to be another set of classes. So it was a pretty wide and diffuse interface that we would have to deal with, and also there was no contractual guarantee that from release to release the interface would stay the same. So we might be shooting for, you know, at a kind of moving target. Uh, so, so we kind of, kind of scrapped that. I mean, we, we held on to that as a last kind of resort, but we kind of, uh, kind of put that aside. And uh, we started kind of thinking about maybe changing the behavior of the underlying system, right? And if you think about it, you know, um, Atlassian's recommendation to use NFS is exactly that, right? Um, is that the, the, they, could, the, they can write code that um, saves attachments as if it's local files. And just by the abstraction of file systems, uh, you can kind of get a, a file system that gives you what you want, right? And, uh, but it, it, you know, for those who attended that uh, FS123 talk, you know, writing a file system is a kind of uh, you know, a big deal. It, it's, it's not uh, trivial, right? Um, um, so, uh, and again, I've had a lot of kind of, um, I've used interposers a lot, and so mainly for kind of measurements and, and, and instrumentation, but I uh, kind of looked at uh, the possibility of kind of using interposers to kind of solve this problem. So, to, uh, and to, to look at that, um, so the, during this time, this was uh, around the time of the uh, presidential election, 2016, right, and Clinton had this slogan, you know, when they go low, we go high. So we took the, we riffed on that and kind of took, a, if we can't go high, then just go low, you know. And so we kind of, um, looking lower. Um, so, and, and if you take a step back, um, you know, Jira is just a Java web app, runs in Tomcat, right? And Tomcat is just some Java code that runs in a JVM. And the JVM is just a native app that uses OS facilities, right? You know, it's, just a, it's just a program. So we, we kind of wanted to take a look at how the JVM behaves when, um, when you upload and download attachments. So in this screen, I hope you can see it, um, it's, um, uh, it's, the out, it's, it's, a, it's edited output from S-Trace, right? So uh, if, if you haven't used S-Trace or you don't use it, uh, it's, a, it's an invaluable tool uh, for debugging and uh, reverse engineering. And in this sense, we're, we're kind of reverse engineering uh, what's going on, right? So if you look at what happens, and, and again, if you do S-Traces, you get a ton of output in, in JVMs because JVMs have so many threads and they're doing so many things. So I, I just kind of uh, captured the, the, the kind of little bit from, a, from the thread that was handling this and just uh, made it presentable here. So you see, when you do an upload, it opens a file uh, for writing. Uh, I've eliminated that option you know, just to make it uh, format better, uh, into a temp attachments f uh, file system tree, right? And you'll see it, everything says temp, right? Temp attachments and a temp file. And then it uh, kind of, uh, as the file is uploading, you see a bunch of writes and writes, and finally it closes, 
And my original kind of thought was to kind of say, okay, well, um, I know where the attachments are going to go, so if I kind of uh, interpose on the open, and then, uh, and then, and if it's an attachment, then I'll keep track of that, and then on the close, I'll figure out, uh, I'll use that as a trigger for writing out to the cloud, right? Um, but uh, the, 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 the actual usage pattern is, makes it even simpler, right? Because uh, after all of the writing to the temp file, uh, there's a rename system call, right? Which kind of renames the one file, uh, the, changes the name from one to another, right? And, and, and that, that makes sense, right? Because if you're doing uploads, right, of files, you don't really want to upload to the final destination. Because if you crash, then you have a file that's incomplete with the right name, but may not have the right content. So the pattern, a safe pattern is usually to write to it, upload to a temp file, and then do a, the atomic rename to get the actual name. So that provided a real excellent point for uh, hooking into the changing the behavior, right? So in rename. So, and then you see the uh, rename here is the uh, um, so original path to a new path, right? That's the kind of signature for rename. So in our rename, what we did was we said, okay, if the old path is under the temp attachment directory and the new path is under the attachment directory, and if the rename succeeds, then also transfer the file over to um, our cloud store. Right? And, and it's impo important to point out here, right, is that one, um, we're not actually changing the system call implementation, right? Uh, you know, that's in the kernel, right? Um, we're changing uh, the kind of little C stub that allows you to call the system call, right? And so uh, normally there's nothing, not much between that stub and the call, but we've been, we're kind of wrapping that so that we kind of get more logic in. Right? And so, uh, so permission-wise, you know, we don't have to have permission, right? We're changing our own program behavior, and so, um, so that's kind of uh, cool, important. So on the download side, uh, so, so imagine that the upload's working and stuff, you have stuff in the cloud, you have stuff in the file system, but you've occasionally cleaned out the file system. And so uh, not everything, uh, not every attachment's on the file system now. So at some point, when uh, a user clicks download, right, clicks on the attachment, it's gonna wanna bring it down. And so, um, so again, I, originally I thought the open call would be the one that I would hook into, but it turns out that uh, I think it's part of the Java file uh, implementation. It does a stat before it opens. It almost al always does that. So if I, if I only did the, uh, if I put the hook into the open, then the stats would have failed, and then you would get, you know, file not found. The, uh, the Java throws an exception, file not found. So, um, so instead, uh, I put the hook for the download into stat, and the rule's fairly simple, right? Because you can do stats on, again, you're, you're kind of in the JVM, and you're doing stats on a lot of different files. So we only care about if the stat fails, right? So if, when the stat fails, then uh, we'll say, okay, what are you trying to stat? If you're trying to stat an attachment, then maybe it's in the cloud. So we'll, we'll go to the cloud, check to see if it's there. If it's not there, then we'll return an error, right? It's really not there. But if it is there, then we'll download it into the proper place and stat on that file and return the stat results there. And uh, th that's worked remarkably well. It's been uh, kind of um, uh, almost four years, three plus years of kind of running in production. Um, uh, uh, so in yesterday's uh, FS123 uh, talk, there was a few thousand lines of code to write the FS, right? For the, my interposer is C code, 300 lines of C code, right? And it's very small and it was really kind of interposing on two system calls. It's really kind of narrow interface as opposed to this really kind of diffuse interface. Um, and uh, and um, the, 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 the team that now kind of supports Jira, um, they also support Confluence for the company, so 6,000 users too. And um, so just this week, they, they rolled out an interposer for Confluence attachments that takes the same approach. Um, uh, the Confluence is a little different. They don't have two separate directories. They put everything in one directory, but the temp file has a .tmp suffix. So the code is a little bit different, but the approach is the same. So. Um, there's uh, many, uh, many other uses. I've kind of used interposers for a good part. Ever since, ever since shared libraries appeared, uh, you had the opportunity to kind of do this, right? Um, the, the, having the DL sim and DL open kind of calls makes things a lot easier. So I, I, I've, I've been using kind of uh, interposers for a long time, primarily for instrumentation. I have a performance engineering kind of bent, right? So uh, where, where instrumentation is lacking, um, writing an interposer, uh, doing a little bit of kind of metric collection around there uh, is pretty effective. Uh, um, uh, the, I guess next weekend uh, we're doing DS uh, daylight savings time change, right? So in the past, kind of, kind of testing that change, uh, uh, you know, 
would require would normally require some you know privilege because you're changing the date on a, a system, right? You can kind of interpose on the time calls, right? And the system. So for a particular process, you can move time ahead. Uh, again, uh, at your own permission, right? Uh, at user level. So you can kind of do t DST tiles testing um, with interposers. Uh, I've been in environments where uh, the I.O., um, the disk I.O. is really slow because uh, the, the infrastructure mandates that the, it goes to two data centers. And so it's going through hardware that's kind of doing t t t a, a near data center and a far data center. And, uh, the, and, the, and because of the sensitivity of the data, the I.O. has to be synchronous. So that's a slow kind of operation. And, and, and uh, that environment, though, is uh, fairly expensive to kind of provide to developers. So, I wrote an interposer to add delays to writes uh, to simulate what would happen in this uh, scenario, so that the developers could get a feel for how much uh, uh, they would, how they would run it in a real environment. You know, it's an approximation; it's not a, uh, but uh, it, it serves the purpose. Um, I talked about uh, originally kind of post-processing after close, right? Uh, that was my original kind of thought for um, the Jira attachment, um, uh, but I've actually done things like. Uh, when the Java compiler, so I wanted to kind of uh, post-process Java class files after they had been compiled. I want to kind of do stuff with it. Um, and uh, what I did there was to kind of interpose on the close of class files and inject my logic so that the post-processing happens as part of the uh, Java, Java C, right? Uh, uh, again, and, again in a, in the, a lot in the Java world, but um, uh, I think it applies to um, you know, other kind of runtimes is that there's a kind of pattern where instead of kind of doing uh, connections to a host port, that you look up the service in some directory, right? JNDI in Java, but it's backed by maybe LDAP or something like that. Okay. Uh, that, that makes kind of testing really hard, right? Because now if, if you want to test on the, uh, the, the actual prod lookup, um, you wind up connecting to a prod server. Uh, not a great thing. Uh, if you create another entry, there's some systems which takes the name of that entry and does something with it, like uh, in JMS durable subscriptions. You kind of add that. So you're creating a, something new in test, and that's not great. So again, an interposer, right, um, that, that takes uh, a mapping between intended connections, when you look at the connect call, uh, intended connections, and your test connection. Right? Uh, again, you could do this with IP tables, but IP tables require privilege. Uh, this one, you're just mucking with your process. So, um, so things are kind of good. And again, there's a million other uses. My, the, the, but my purpose here is to kind of convince you that uh, you should have interposers in your bag of tricks, right? Uh, and, uh, and you should kind of think about opportunities where uh, it's really kind of tough to kind of get at it from the top. So let's try to get at it from a little bit in the middle or below. Um, and again, uh, these days, you know, all these runtimes, they're really you know, late binding, dynamic languages, like right? Java has proxies, uh, Python has monkey patching. Uh, so the, the, the capability is there for kind of runtime modification. I, I don't think, you know, we use it for um, testing and uh, measurements, but it, it has, it can be used, uh, if you test properly, it can be used um, um, for other me mechanisms. Uh, and that's pretty much my talk. Uh, thanks. And also, um, you know, we have a booth uh, here at the exhibit hall, so stop by. I want to chat and uh, have time for questions. Hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, right. Uh, very enjoyable presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one question I had from the beginning is um, you're, you're, you're running, you're linking during the, the program execution when it's starting. Uh, what about, uh, do you have any patterns for doing it if it's running, you can't stop it and restart it. Um, I don't. <laughs> uh, th so th that would involve patching kind of memory, right? That's running and stuff. And I, I don't have any safe patterns for doing that. Uh, okay. Yeah. And one more, and this is kind of open-ended, uh, so I'll let you just whatever uh, philosophy you have. Um, so uh, in approaching like systems management, I see you're modifying, you know, the the, the runtime, the startup, and do you have a sort of a way to handle that uniqueness. It's kind of a unicorn in the environment. So when you have new ops teams come in and so you wonder, well, are they even going to know this? Are they going to get hit by this? Right. Thank you. 
Yeah, so th th that's the, the tricky part, right, is that uh, it's, it, it's, it's doing it late, right? And it's, and it's doing it at the, the kind of time when you run. Most of the kind of documentation is around kind of the, the, uh, the, 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 the deployment and, and how you normally run it. Um, so uh, I don't really have a great answer to that. Uh, basically, uh, you know, the, 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 the Jira uh, uh, invocation is wrapped in an Atlassian start script. And so that's where we kind of put comments around the need to kind of, so, so the interposer also requires some environment variables, right? That's the kind of, you know, standard for kind of configuring kind of uh, uh, these type of things. Uh, you could put it in a config file, but um, uh, so we have a bunch of environment variables, so we have comments in the start script, and that, that's the kind of, but yeah, it's a valid point. You know, testing is another thing, right? You have to make sure that you're respecting the, you don't, you don't want to wreck things, right? You just want to kind of uh, enhance things. Uh, so you got to make sure you do that. So there's, there's things around the edges that are very important uh, that we have to kind of do to, to leverage this stuff. Thank you. Yeah. All right, thanks.